Right, we should be live now. Okay. Good morning, everyone. I believe we are now live streaming, although I do not yet see the live button on the website, but we'll hope that that's just a, a slight technology lag. Um, so good morning. We are going to go ahead and get started with the um, education bills on the agenda. And Abby, I'm going to ask you if you could please go ahead and let in um, Dr. Martirano and the, um, the Board of Ed members who are um, in the waiting room. I believe it's um, and please switch Jennifer me. Mallow nice. is in the waiting room. I, I thought Vicki Catronia would be joining us as well. I don't see her. Um, okay. So um, we're starting with our education bills and first up um, Howard County 521. I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Senator Lamb who is the sponsor and I will remind members to please um, indicate in the chat if you have a, uh, a question for discussion. Senator Lamb, go ahead. Thank you, um, Delegate Feldmark. So um, this bill we did, um, I guess, introduce in a way last week for uh, consideration by the delegation. Um, this bill, um, for folks who are returning, you're familiar with it last year. We did take a vote on it. It did pass that delegation. It just ran out of time during the uh, shortened session. The bill is really to put some guardrails on um, the redistricting process. It's really, it really its intent is to help ensure that um, we can reduce the instances of um, large scale uh, redistricting if we can um, uh, have this done in a more um, even fashion. Um, and so what the bill does it, is that it, A, does not require any redistricting. So I want to just be clear about that because I think that has come up um, in the past. It does not require um, redistricting. It simply puts um, reporting requirements in place for when the board meets its own policy 6010, which is um, its own redistricting policy. And so um, there's actually, and it it's, uh, defers to the county board on how to set those um, guidelines. Um, and so the county board can um, at any point in time um, make its own adjustments to its own policies. But what it says is that there's actually a 10% cushion um, beyond the, uh, the ideal um, capacity for each school. Beyond that, um, so at um, 120% capacity, because it's another, there's a 10% cushion beyond what the um, capacity set by the school system is. There's another 10% cushion in this bill beyond that. Um, once you go beyond that, there's a requirement to at least report back to the delegation on um, the status of uh, some of these schools that are outside of the ideal capacity bounds. And then if it's 10% beyond that, so I think um, then the county school system does need to report back to us um, and go through the policy 6010, which is their own policy, and then report back those again. It's really intended to help, um, um, you know, ensure that there is uh, proper awareness and, and, um, and the, the ability for uh, the school system to report back to us and to the county itself, because it's a uh, multifactorial problem and process when you look at um, uh, schools that are outside of their ideal capacity, uh, both in terms of where new families and units are being uh, brought in or developed, um, as well as the need for funding to be able to build or renovate new schools or enlarge them if needed. And uh, certainly the state has a role to play in that as well. And then uh, with policy decisions being made by the school system. So it helps keep us all on the same page. Um, I'll stop there and just see if there are any questions from folks. Thank you, Senator Lamb. Um, 
education members. I know we've uh, we've heard this bill before, and so I, there may not be any questions. Is there any discussion? Okay, seeing none, I think, oh. I can move the bill is what I, so I'd like to move the bill. So I'm gonna go ahead and, I'm sorry, Delegate Hill, you were making a motion, is that correct? Yes, I'd like to move the bill. Okay. I believe it was already actually seconded, but we'll go ahead and take a second. Someone would like to second the motion? Sure, I'll second it. Okay. And um, and now Senator Hester did have um, a question. Oh, just clarifying the bill number. This is HOCO 521. Okay. Now, um, members, we are going to actually, looks like we are ready to vote. We're actually gonna wait to vote. Um, both Delegate Pendergrass and Senator Gazzoni had some obligations this morning. We are fortunate to have um, leadership uh, positions uh, in our delegation. Unfortunately, that often means there are conflicts for their time. Um, they are both uh, trying to join us later this morning. So we're going to actually hold on voting um, until they are here. So we will move on to Howard County 721, which is also Senator Lamb. Yeah, thank you. So Howard County 721 um, is a very straightforward bill. I think this, this, the intent of this bill is because um, I know I had heard from a lot of constituents who are concerned about um, how the end of the redistricting process took place, that there were movements of polygons right before the final vote. Um, uh, polygons that had previously not even been in, in, under consideration for movement. And so the, um, we had heard from many folks um, who were either not under consideration of being moved or were, but then um, were moved differently from what the prior uh, proposal had been that felt that they did not have an opportunity right at the end there to actually weigh in publicly um, with their concerns. Um, either for or in opposition to. Um, you know, what we conveyed, and I think many of us at the time conveyed to them, was to simply, um, you know, email the board members, which they were monitoring for their feedback, but they still felt that they didn't have that opportunity that other households had earlier in the process to be able to actually publicly testify um, on, the, on the proposal before it was voted on finally. So, um, the bill simply requires that there be uh, one more hearing taking place right before uh, the board takes a final vote on um, the redistricting plans. Um, and the intent isn't really to cause an endless series of, of hearings. Um, because the board is gonna make a decision, um, uh, but it gives the families that um, you know, may have had uh, changes at the last minute that move them from one, uh, uh, polygon to another, that they would have an opportunity to be able to um, weigh in there at the end. So it's really just a, a accountability bill, just a transparency bill, so that folks that um, may be in, uh, involved in the final stages of some of these changes feel like they have an opportunity to voice their concerns just equally to those that um, at the beginning of the process had more time to do so. Uh, Delegate Ebersol. Thank you, Madam Chair. So this, as you point out, uh, if decisions are being made quickly at the end, this could become uh, a sort of a circular process where people come in and make suggestions and they make changes. And so I'm a little concerned. It does say public testimony. I would like to think that public testimony could mean that they could submit it in a written form in a way that would be, you know, some sort of, a, you know, testimony that people could read. I, I, I'm hoping that they, people could do that. They could weigh in electronically, not necessarily calling a meeting each time that, it, that a change is made. Um, I don't know if, uh, if council wants to advise on that or if uh, Dr. Lamb, you want to uh, talk about your intent. I think the intent was to actually allow folks to have one last opportunity to have a public 
testimony um, beyond just an electronic, you know, email or written correspondence in. Um, you know, I think that was where we heard, where I heard a lot of concerns was um, um, from folks that felt like they didn't have an opportunity there to um, weigh in at the end. Now, obviously they can still email folks and just like we have folks that email us as well, but I think um, they wanted to have that opportunity for verbal testimony. So follow up if I may, Madam Chair. Thanks. Um, so presumably we're having this testimony with the idea that people testify, not just to testify, they testify with the idea that the board will listen to them and maybe make a change. So then if they testify and the board makes a change, then do they have to have yet another, would this bill require them to have yet another public meeting if they make an adjustment based on what they've listened to? It would. Um, they, you know, and, and we're not just talking about one household and such, because these are polygons that they're moving, right? So mm -hmm. um, I think it's, it's really just have the final check um, for folks that are new, uh, newly moved to be able to weigh in on that process. Okay, thank you. And next we have a question from Senator Hester. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, question for the sponsor and also Dr. Monterano, if he's able to, to answer. There, um, the, the question is, how do we avoid the kind of circular you know, reference that, that Delegate Ebersol just mentioned? Is there, and, and Senator Lamb, I, I believe you were working on a potential amendment. Um, so I don't know if you have that amendment and also if Dr. Martirano could weigh in on how you avoid, you know, having continuous public testimony at the end. I mean, I was, I got contacted by a lot of people who were really, really angry about this last minute shift. But my question is how do we avoid that? Good morning, everyone. Um, first of all, uh, it's good to be with you this morning. The, the issue associated with the last redistricting was it was a major comprehensive redistricting, as you all know. Uh, the Board of Education conducted over eight public hearings that resulted in over 800 uh, individuals coming forward in person to the Board of Education, in addition to thousands of correspondence that we received through email and testimony and other supports. Uh, the, the board, like with policies, uh, they set a, a time for when they review that feedback in public hearing, and then they always reserve the right to make adjustments at the end before they um, make their final decision. My concern, and I expressed this to, uh, to Dr. Lamb, was when does that end? Because there's gonna be additional adjustments that could be based on that. And we have a very solid timeline for implementation. So there has to be a finality when this actually ends is what I would be advocating for. I surely encourage all opportunities for public hearings, but we would have to have a date of ending for then me to be allowed to do the work for full implementation, which takes a considerable amount of time. Yeah, and we're open to, go ahead. Somebody gonna say something? No, I was moving on to the next question, but if you wanna to respond to that as well, go ahead. No, I mean, we're open to, to thoughts on that. That's why we wanted to introduce this last meeting to see if there were any thoughts or for uh, consideration or amendments. This discussion on this bill was cut short, um, but uh, you know, if there are thoughts on, on preferences from the delegation when to, um, where to draw the line or at some threshold to uh, not need another follow-up hearing from the board, um, you know, we're open to that. It's also the board's decision as to when to, um, you know, if, if they don't make any changes, then that also draws this, this process to a close, right? And then next question is from Delegate Terrassa. Yeah. Um, Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so I think this is a really important piece of legislation because I think the biggest concern that I'm hearing from my constituents and that I have over the years when I was on the council and then now is uh, or last year, I guess, is polygons that didn't weren't even involved in the first place. So the issue is 
that people who weren't even under notice that they might be um, redistricted suddenly get drawn into the process. So I'm not sure, I don't have the draft right in front of me. I will pull it up in a second, but I don't know if this is the, the limiting factor that you have in there, but it seems to me that as long as they're pulling in polygons that haven't been part of the process before, there should be a new hearing. If you're not pulling in polygons that have been under notice that they are part of the redistricting process, perhaps you don't need a new hearing. But the issue is, and I've seen this in my district many, many times over the years, is that people don't even know they're being, they don't even know there's a consideration of their polygon being redistricted. And then suddenly in the last minute, they get drawn into it and suddenly they're being redistricted to another school and they didn't even know it was a consideration. So I don't know if that, is that the piece, um, Senator Lamb, that you were concerned about is those people that are sort of new to the process and didn't know they were going to be part of the process? Yeah, that was. Uh, certainly, you know, we had, I had folks in, in, in my district and I think almost every district that was in Howard County had similar instances where they didn't have the opportunity to weigh in the first time around because they didn't actually weren't aware that they were going to be redistricted or under consideration for movement. And then with, um, um, you know, with some changes there at the end, they felt like the folks that were proposed for movement had much more opportunity to weigh into the process than they did and didn't feel like they had an equal chance to do so, even though they could send emails. You know, I think for them and for, and I think we see this too, with many folks that come to testify before us, they see some value in being able to uh, appear before the board itself or before the delegation or before our committees. And that's why people do so. Um, and so, you know, I think they felt that they didn't have an opportunity to be able to, to do that when they weren't even being considered before for any movement. Um, and it was just very, a very quick proposal at the end that moved them and they only had days to be able to weigh in on um, that. So uh, so Madam Chair, if I could just follow up really quickly. So it isn't necessarily a change in the movement, like if they're being moved to this school or this school, but whether they're involved in the process at all that you're trying to get to. Yeah, particularly those folks that are that were never considered at all. I know we had neighborhoods in, in District 12 that were never even on the uh, list of polygons proposed to be moved until the very end. Um, and so... Um, and so, you know, they didn't feel like they were, um, you know, part of that process and the decision-making process because they weren't even up for consideration until the very end. Right. So what I, cause what I've seen is that people who are in the process of redistricting mount huge opposition to being redistricted but then the people that get dragged in at the last minute, and I guess dragged is not a very nice word, but they get brought in at the last minute, um, don't really have an opportunity to mount an opposition. And so um, things get, sometimes get a little out of whack at the end in that sense or in terms of input. Right, and it's not even just a chance to show up for testimony, they didn't even know that they right. should show up for testimony, right? They had no idea until the very end. And at that point it's too late because there wasn't one more time for them to be able to, to show up um, and, and they weren't notified, right? Um, the bill doesn't really require a hearing for any move. It's, it's just for polygons that you know, weren't moved in the original proposal. Um, and so it's really just those folks that are in these polygons and we're not talking about single households, right? We're talking when they move, they move polygons. And so it's these polygons that um, weren't originally considered. Okay, thank you. And I appreciate you putting in this legislation. Okay, thank you. And our next question is from Delegate Kittleman. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, that would be a critical criteria, uh, but it occurs to me perhaps another criteria might be if the plan changes more than some percentage. Um, I think at that point, a lot of the people who already have had something to say would still want to weigh in. 
Right. I think what when we work with the drafter on this, the the version that was drafted um, that when we worked with them said that it was really just for those polygons that were not in the original plan for consideration for any movement that would have this opportunity at the end to be able to weigh in. So if your polygon was already proposed for movement, you don't have you know a second bite at the apple. It's to give the, the people that never had a bite at the apple at least one bite. Okay, thank you. Um, I do not see any other uh, questions indicated in the chat. Any, any additional questions on this bill? Okay, um, thank you, Senator Lamb. We are gonna move on to Howard County 1121, um, Delegate Atterbury. Thank you, Madam Chair, Mr. Chair. Um, so this is a reintroduction from last year. Um, and the purpose of it is to generate funds for our deferred maintenance um, projects, which last year were at um, half a billion dollars. Um, but Madam Chair, I am gonna hold this right now. Okay, thank you. Um, then we are moving on to um, the, the bills that have been held over. And I believe Senator Lamb, you're gonna share us for this portion. Yeah, sure. So next on the agenda are bills held over. Um, there are three bills here and then um, LBIs afterwards. So the three bills, we can start with the first one on the agenda, it's Howard County 2-21. This is um, the Class A alcoholic beverages licenses quota by election district. This is Senator Gazzoni's bill. Um, as we mentioned, he, because of some leadership meetings that are taking place, won't be able to join us until about 9.45, but he is, um, uh, you know, we're gonna go ahead and have a discussion on this. Um, I know we had a healthy discussion before. I think there are some amendments that people wanna put on the table. Um, and so I'll entertain a motion to at least begin discussion on this. Is there a motion to? I'll move the bill. Okay, is there a second? Sounds like uh, Doug and Votney seconded. Um, so we're open for discussion. And if you have a question or want to speak, if you can just type into the chat box. Uh, I see Senator Hester, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I worked, um, I, first of all, I want to thank everybody, including Jack Milani, for joining us for a conversation uh, where we really got into the weeds on this one. Um, and my understanding of the bill is that it's really to, uh, you know, prevent a clustering of, uh, of liquor stores. Um, I did have one amendment uh, because we felt that given the geographic scope of the western um, part of the county and the, the, the lack of population, we should set like a floor on the um, on the lower limit of licenses. And I, I'm sorry, I don't really know what the process is. I had the amendment drafted um, and I, I was chatting back and forth with Dara last night. Do you guys have the amendment? Could the amendment be brought up on the screen? Dara, can you go ahead and share your screen and pull that up so everyone can view it? It's quite simple. On page, on page one in line six, strike one and substitute six, and the same thing on line on pa on uh, page two. So uh, effectively, what this does is it just says it keeps the whole bill the same, but it says like at least in each election district you will have you can have up to at least six licenses. And I think uh, Abby, our delegation administrator, did send around the amendment to folks. Uh, Delegate Feldmark has a question, followed by Delegate Terraza. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Senator Hester, for all of your work on this. Um, I guess my my question is how this amendment impacts the overall limit for the county. 
My understanding is that given that we're moving from a total number of um, licenses to licenses by election district, we wound up with a lot of half licenses. You can't really have half a license. So I believe that it has minimal change on the total number of licenses compared to what we have now. Um, but I would really like um, somebody with more expertise in this topic to confirm that. Could, could Mr. Milani maybe speak to that? I know he was involved in helping uh, come up with the solution. Oh, uh, yes. Thanks, Madam Chair. Remember that we talked about this in the past, um, and this is true of all the counties. You have to get to the next full license before it's granted. I think um, Delegate Ebersol gave us a math lesson in this originally because there's always going to be some half licenses. And I think um, Senator Hester was concerned out in the West. And, you know, quite honestly, we don't have a problem. We think it, it's, it's a great compromise because, quite honestly, they haven't asked for a new license out there since mid-90s. So I think it's there. If it's necessary, it's there. It's, a, it's almost like a safeguard for those districts. So, you know, I think this is probably a, a reasonable compromise. It certainly will help on the east side, you know, and, and again, not, not as big a tool as some of you would like on the east side, but it certainly helps. And this allows for the west, if there's somewhere that the zoning may change, that possibly they could add another license. And, and Mr. Chair, if I can just ask one. Yeah, can can you confirm, Mr. Milani, is this only going to impact the West? Do, do all of the other districts already have, based on population, at least six licenses per district? Or can you the remind only, us what that breakdown is? Yeah, the only district currently that is is closed off is all the way out West. And that would be, I believe it was like 3.6 licenses available, and they currently have three. So, you know, maybe the next population, yeah, they might get to that full license, but I really think in the West, it's kind of a, a moot point because there's just not the zoning. There's nowhere to put them. So, you know, to me, this is just a safeguard and I think it, it protects if the zoning changes or there's a parcel that, that comes about, it, it would not hinder that, which is similar to what the shopping center exception is, but obviously that doesn't work in the West because it's just too big. Thank you. Okay. Uh, next, we have um, Delegate Terraza, and I saw that Senator Hester raised her hand too. So after Delegate Terraza, in the order that we have is Delegate Ebersol, Delegate Novotny, and then Senator Hester. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, um, and thank you, Mr. Milani, for spending your time with us. Uh, I think it was last Monday. Um, Senator Hester, I'm maybe this question is for Mr. Milani, but I'm confused by this one because how does this work over time? So this is six now, but does this, is this six currently and then it goes down? This is starting at six or you're always gonna have six licenses. I believe it sets a lower floor so that you always have at least six. Should we have massive population expansion in the West? I believe we could go up to seven as we add 4,000 more people. But it just allows for, I mean, given that we're going through the Howard County general plan process right now and things could change, it just allows in these districts the chance to add one or two you know, more stores should that opportunity present itself. Um, but I mean, so it, it stays at six and it goes up if we add up more than the 4,000. I guess I'm concerned because to me, this is adding liquor stores to our county, because even though I understand, basically this is the opposite of the rounding down problem. This is rounding up. So we're actually adding, um, we're at this, this amendment would add, from my perspective, it seems like it would add liquor stores. First of all, it would add liquor stores to the West. If I guess I don't represent the Western part of the county and 
guess if that's something desired, I guess I'd wonder why not move them from somewhere else. Um, and then I'm concerned about us adding liquor store, uh, liquor licenses to Howard County through this. Is it my question? What, what, I guess the question is, maybe it's for um, Delegate Eversol, but like, isn't this rounding up? <laughs> I, mean, I mean, isn't this taking each of those, uh, Mr. Milani, maybe it seems like he has an answer, but. Yeah, Mr. Milani, go ahead. Yeah, actually this is, this is what they would call around the state is front loading. You're moving potential licenses to an area, normally in anticipation of, of you know, more residents. I think in the West, you know, I, I would think that you might get that additional license in the district that's closed off when you have the census completed. But I guess this is just a safety net that they get that in case it doesn't. Because remember, they don't have the opportunity in the West for the shopping center exception because typically, you know, you're just not going to find 200,000 square feet retail centers just based because of the septic and and well issues they just don't build that big in the west um so this i think was was the compromise was to try to not completely close that district um you know speaking for the industry it doesn't phase us because we just don't believe that it's going to be a factor in the west because maybe you get another one but but i've lived out here for 20 some years and i can think of maybe one place maybe that I could put another license out here, but it's fairly close to another one. So, you know, the board probably, and I'm not even gonna say that, the board would have to make that decision. I'll leave it at that. The liquor board. Yes, and that's, you know, that would be, cause it's the only location I'm aware of is fairly close to an existing license. And as a resident, you know, as a, as a person in the industry, I have a different, but as, as a resident, my opinion would be, I would hope they wouldn't grant it. Um, Mr. Chairman, can did you I, have one? Do you have yeah, one more follow-up? Just follow-up. But yeah, on yeah. what on what basis would they not grant it? <laughs> I think need accommodation. You know, it would have to have a certain uniqueness. Um, I could send you. Well, you you probably know the code yeah. of the, the you know the order of things that have to be. Remember, the applicant has to prove. Right. You know, they have to come in and prove these things in order for that to be granted. Right, but I I guess I've not seen. I guess the with the cases that came to us as the liquor board, um, a lot of sort maybe maybe they that happens more often at the um, alcoholic hearing board, but I had not seen a lot of cases where need was not found once there were people who said there was a need. Mm -hmm. It, it happens around the state all the time. In Howard Not everything. They're not automatic. Yeah, but in Howard County? Um, it happens around the state all the time. Not in Howard County. <laughs> um, not as often. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> you no, know, um, Senator Hester did punch into the chat box that the sponsor is considering this a friendly amendment. I did speak to the sponsor, too, and he does agree with it. Um, Next on the list, we have Delegate Ebersol, followed by Delegate Novotny, then Senator Hester, and then Delegate Atterbury. Uh, Delegate Ebersol, go ahead. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you all for your, uh, the math uh, prowess that you think I possess. You all get B pluses and I get a B. Um, I don't think this does what we wanted to do. I'm looking at the language right now and it says acceptance provided is, you know, in this section, the board may not issue more than one class A license for every, of any type for every 4,000 residents. This simply changes that to six. It may not issue more than six class A licenses of any type for every 4,000 residents. And it still says for each election district. It, it, maybe I, you know, I, I am just a math teacher. I am not a lawyer, but it seems to me that we are allowing for six times as many liquor stores per 4,000 residents than we would than the original intent and the way the law was actually written countywide, just by striking one and putting in six, it's not particular to any election district. And it, 
I, I believe that it would allow for a 600% increase in liquor stores in each election district in Howard County. Am I, does anybody want to, maybe, uh, you know, maybe council can, can comment on that. Um, so I'm concerned about this. I understand the point of this uh, amendment, but I'm concerned that it really might do much more than we expected. I guess it looks like Mr. Milani can try to answer that. If, if Dara, if, if you have any um, thoughts on weighing in afterwards, feel free to do that. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair. Um, Delegate Ebersol, I will be honest with you. I'm going on the premise that we're going to put a six in those two districts that, that don't have six. Um, I just saw this this morning, and with all amendments, I would run this by you know, Mr. Wise, and I'd like to just put it into the bill. But I'm going off of the premise that they want a minimum of six in each of the districts. And I think we have to make sure it's written that way because so I understand what you're six. saying. It, it almost looks like if it's just substituting the six for the one, then it would be six per 4,000. So I, I think the intent, I think we all agree on the intent. We just have to make sure it's, it's drafted correctly. And again, I would not comment on whether it is or not until we run it by our legal counsel, but the intent we certainly agree with. Does, does Mr. Moriarty have any comment on that as far as the amendment goes and my interpretation of the way it looks? Sure, um, I, uh, I I would agree. So to, to, to give an example, rather than just be dealing with abstract numbers, uh, what this would do if you change it from one to six is um, to say we had a election district uh, of 16,000 residents. And without the amendment, the, the bill would say that the board may not issue more than one class A license of any type for every 4,000 residents, that would be no more than uh, four class A licenses uh, of any type in that election district. If we say six for every 4,000 residents, um, it, it would be- 24. 24, there you go, sorry. <laughs> I'm happy to help um, on that part. Yeah. The, um, the legal I, part, I appreciate, thank you. Uh, if, if the intent is to change um, based on what Mr. Milani said there, um, I, I may have misheard. I believe you said no, no less than than six um, per four thousand in a district. That would be a quite easy language change. We would simply, uh, if I may, I I think the intent of the amendment, and uh, the writer can can comment, but I think the intent of the amendment was to say uh, one per four thousand with a minimum of six beyond that. Well, okay, then we got to fix the amendment before we even talk about it. So thanks. I'm done. Um, Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, sure, Delia, the, just, just to clarify, that is, uh, is the suggestion that it would be um, a, a minimum of no less than six, and then beyond that six, one per 4,000 residents or would it be just one per, I'm, sorry, I'm, I'm trying to think of uh, numerical examples. So if we say one per 4,000 residents. With, um, no fewer than, with no fewer than six. No fewer than six, so. After that, one per 4,000 comma with no fewer than six. Yeah, so it would be in, in a district of 28,000, we would have seven, but in a district of 12,000, we would have six other than three. Okay, um, that will require some wording but I, I don't think that's too complicated for me to to fix right now uh, thank you very much i i, I uh, madam chair i don't know what the appropriate procedure is if you want yeah, to go ahead continue go discussing ahead, this bill or yeah can um dar can i just suggest to you in so in paragraph a it says except as provided in subsection b can we just say except as provided in subsection b in subsections b and c of this section and then you just add a new subsection that is probably the most uh, Does that make sense? Yeah, that's that's the clearest. And then what we okay. do then. So I think can can you take a quick crack at drafting that while conversation continues, and Absolutely. we'll pull it back up as soon as it's ready. Sure. Thanks, Mr. Milani. You want to clarify could, that? Could it just be as simple as each district would have a minimum of six licenses, regardless of the population? And that way, it doesn't even attempt to play with the formula. And the 
the issue with that is then if we have more than six, there's no limit. Hypothetically, we could have, uh, I, I, the, the, the right. board would prevent uh, that, but there is no, if we just say each has at least six, there's no limit, upper limit to the amount we could have. Based on the, everything else would be based upon the population. Pardon me, I'm not sure I understand that. I would just be very, I, I would not do anything that would play with the, or, or even confuse the one per 4,000. I would simply state that each district would have a minimum of six licenses, irregardless of the population or some, some, I mean, no offense, but I'm sure in the legal world that will come out as a couple paragraphs, but I think that's the intent. <laughs> You're probably right. I, I imagine that the, the language to a new subsection C is, is going to be essentially just a sentence of, um, no, no district shall have fewer than uh, six Class A licenses issued by the well, I'll rephrase it. Okay. Um, next, we have Delgate Novotny. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, quickly to a couple of the comments that have been made. I don't think this actually adds stores or licenses. It just provides opportunity, actual equal opportunity to the people in the West. And, and part of the discussion has become, and I know, uh, Mr. Milani, you are much more an expert than I am at this, but um, I, I believe you can't really prove a negative, right? So if there are no licenses available, you don't know how many people are out there trying to do something, looking and seeing that they can't get a license. So I, I strongly approve of what Senator Hester is putting forward just to give us a floor with opportunity in the West. I appreciate it. Okay. And after that, we have um, Senator Hester. Did you want to chime in again? Right, number yes. two at the Apple. Go ahead. Well, I just need to, I feel like I need to go on record clarifying that I am, with this amendment, I was not advocating for six times the number of liquor stores in the county. <laughs> That's not what I want to be known for. As Delegate Novotny said, we're just simply striving to allow a bit of, ex of, of economic opportunity should there be more growth in the West and not wanting to have these huge, you know, huge strip malls out there. So just, just for the record, my intent was a minimum of six, but not six per one four thousand people. Thank you. Okay. So after that, I think based on the chat box, I see Delegate Atterbury followed by Delegate Hill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So just a couple of questions or comments. So if um, Mr. Milani, so if you could ex just kind of explain to me. So one, I am concerned about not setting a max. So you could, if you could explain to me why I shouldn't be concerned about that, I would appreciate it. So if this is increasing opportunities in the West, is this also increasing um, in the, you know, opportunities in the rest of the county, um, which I'm not advocating for, to be clear. I'm just trying to figure out if that's increasing um, license opportunities in the rest of the county, because sort of to follow up on Delegate Terrasa's comments earlier about that the licenses are always approved. I mean, where I live in less than a half a mile, there's three liquor stores, probably less than that. So um, when you're talking about increasing opportunities in the West and the rest of the county, I do want to make sure I mean, because you sort of alluded to as a resident out in the West, you wouldn't be happy like with a bunch of liquor stores. So I do want to make sure we're not concentrating them in certain areas um, in the county as well. Uh, yes, Delegate. I think, I think what I'm referring to in the West is the zoning isn't there. We don't have that type of zoning to put much retail anywhere. I think in the East, um, currently, Every available license as the law is today in the county could go anywhere. All this bill does is it, it defines the election districts and helps try to place these licenses where there is population. And normally where there's population, you have more zoning for retail centers. Um, I would say that, that you know, there are some concentrations of liquor licenses that uh, I think are 
or too many, but, you know, oftentimes they come with a big center. And I think sometimes when they apply, because they have a big center, it's granted. Um, you know, quite often, I know that there are protests to it, but for whatever reason, I think that, you know, when they have bigger centers, it's just, I guess it's assumed that they're going to give it to them. You know, and, and I would agree with you. There are some that are, to, in my opinion, much too close together. So can I follow up, Mr. Chair? Sure. So sure. thank you. So if this bill says no fewer than six per 4,000 <clears throat> residents, does that also mean in the rest of the county, if the population increases by 4,000, then there'll be six more licenses available? Well, I think it's just, I think everyone agreed on the intent. I think that that wording is just, is, is going to be changed to just say that a minimum of six per district. So most districts are well beyond that. This, okay. I think, off the top of my head, I think it only affects two districts. <clears throat> okay. Do we, what districts are those? They're both? Five and uh, four. It would be like um, <clears throat> reservoir area, Maple Lawn area, and then the West. So if Maple Lawn population was to increase by 4,000 people, which given all the proposed development, it's going to, <laughs> um, then there are going to be a minimum of six licenses offered because we already have three right here. I could walk to two of them. If I was ambitious, I could walk to all three of them. But. Yeah, I think, I think what it would do would be the licenses will be in place prior to the population getting there. So I think what happens is they're available before the population gets there. And a few years out, it'll probably, it's almost like an axis where they'll meet together, you know, and again, based on the building in that area, provided we come out of this pandemic, well, I think that's gonna happen in a few years. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. Um, thank you. Next, we have um, Olga Hill. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, so, Jack, I, I, I want to follow up on the conversation that we had um, because we kind of talked about this. We have two different problems. We have a, a problem out in the east where there's a concern there won't be enough um, liquor licenses for a relatively small sparse population and people would have to travel too far. The amendment we're working on now gets to that. The other problem is that there are areas where there is a concentration of licenses, regardless of the cap, whether it's six per, you know, or one or 4,000, whatever, that they tend to be concentrated within a one mile, two mile radius, right? Um, and when we talked about it, I asked about could we as the state put amendments in to this bill, use this vehicle to cap the density or to define, you know, what that, you know, what that density limit should be to give direction to the local board who we've all said seems to be reluctant to not, as long as they're allowed an additional license, they seem to be reluctant not to grant it based on geography. And what you were explaining to me, if I understood you correctly, is that this, that's not a state control issue that should be handled at the zoning board level. Can you well, understand you? Can you explain why we're not putting? I think, I think delegate that I, I would think is more zoning. I think because in the East, the constant, the zoning is concentrated, all the retail and all the, um, I guess, business local zoning is all in certain areas. It seems to cluster all of the retail, including liquor stores. Now I, I did, I, I would comment that, Senator Hester had sent some information out on, I believe it was some of the other states uh, through the legislative committees you're on. And they talked about, they had actual distance limits. I am not aware of those in the state of Maryland, but I did read those. And, you know, I think it's, you know, in the future, it might be something you look at because obviously um, maybe some follow-up with some folks in those areas to see how it's worked. Cause I had never, Again, in Maryland, I've never seen that done, but it, it was, and I believe if Senator Hester could correct me, but it was more than one, it was, it was quite a few states that had, had gone to that type model. And so 
I mean, yeah, we could wait for another time, but based on what Senator Hester has sent out, it suggests that we as the state could say to the county, yes, we're gonna you know, allow you to, to limit it to 4,000 and we wanna make sure that if you're a, a sparsely populated area, you can have a, a minimum number, even if your population doesn't match it. But in those denser areas, you have to separate based on these natural geography or whatever. So we can, there is a way for us to do this without zoning and this bill would be the vehicle to do it if we're gonna do it. It, it could be, I mean, I, I'll be totally honest with you that I had not been aware of that until Senator Hester and her staff are, has sent it around. It's, it's an interesting concept. I would be, um, I would be less than honest if I told you I would be a little uncomfortable without checking with my counterparts in other states as to how that's worked out, but I certainly think it's something that you could look at to, you know, to, okay. to achieve that. And, and Mr. Chair, I know we're going to, I would like us to continue the discussion, but with that in mind, I'm, I'm hoping that we will hold this bill one more week so we can look at addressing what is a concern for many of us that we're having too much density of liquor stores um, in, in, in certain areas, not, yeah, concentration of liquor stores that the, 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 the election district density is not bad, but they're being concentrated. Thank you. So I see Mr. Moriarty has um, an amendment, that, I guess a cleaner, a, a new a revision to the amendment that's ready to share. I don't know if uh, you wanna share your screen if you have that available or um, is there anything you want to discuss about that in the meantime before we move? Mr. To the Chair, next? if you could share a link to it, that would be much better. That way, um, I could go side by side before it disappears. Is that possible? Yeah, um, maybe if we could do both. I think, uh, okay, Ms. Murray, if, if you can send it to Abby, Abby can send it around to. Uh, unless there's a link that you can just put into the chat box, but. Um, I think for sake of public disclosure too, it's important for us to put it on the screen so that folks that are viewing elsewhere can also see this. Um, Moriarty, are you able to do that? Sure, so I'm just sending it to Abby now and then I will, I can put it on the screen if desired. Um, okay, and then Abby, if you can forward it to the delegation as soon as you get it, that'd be great, thanks. Go ahead. Senator Hester, it's her hand raised. Do you want to say something? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just while we're waiting, I, I thought I would offer that the sponsor, his original intent with the bill was to limit the number of licenses on the east of the county. And the way he described it to me was this was a good first step. The NCSL stuff you know, can get much more, the stuff that I got from other states from the National Conference of Legislative, um, it can get much more complicated. And I didn't want to, I didn't want to slow down the, the, the good senators, you know, bill. So I was just trying to, 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 to keep with the original intent of the bill, but do something small on the Western side to allow for economic opportunity. Okay, thank you. I do have Delegate Terraza with a question afterwards, but Mr. Moriarty, um, anything that you want to describe or explain here with the amendment? Thanks for the quick draft on this. Of course. Um, so what it currently does now is it does not change the um, the upper limit. It, it, that is still um, that the board may issue no more than one Class A license per uh, 4,000 residents of each election district. However, um, the, there shall be at least six Class A licenses issued in each election district. And basically this would only uh, change things for, if my math is correct, 
election districts with fewer than 24,000 people, that, that number or above, it's still going to be um, one per 4,000 people because the, the minimum of, of six would already be met in those cases. However, election districts with fewer than 24,000 residents uh, would have a minimum of six Class A licenses issued by the board. I see Mr. Milani. Yeah, I see Mr. Milani have a, you have a question just, on just, the amendment. If I may, um, yeah. I would rather use the word may because I think if you put shall, then the boards, they have to accept the, the applicant and give it to them. That, that, that was my concern to you, Mr. Chair. Okay. Um, okay. Ms. Marardi, I assume you can just edit that right there. Sure. Um, just, just to address that concern, Mr. Milani, you're, you're worried that uh, the language of shall issue would mean that a, re a certain request cannot be denied i would be afraid that it would make it much harder i would i could think of several lawyers that would argue the point that that the, the applicants fit and proper that's all they would have to prove okay, i will i will uh re request that you allow me to just double check through our code because there are certain requirements for uh you know stylistically language that we have to use in the code when you were um essentially obligating or prohibiting a certain act, which in this case would be issuing fewer than six class A licenses. Uh, that issue may arise um, if there are fewer than six applications, I suppose. However, that might still be the case with the word may. M yeah. Mr. Chair, can I? Um... Yeah, just on the on the drafting here, Dara, can we, um, if we're changing from shall to may, then I think we really should change from no fewer than to up to. Right, because saying they may issue no fewer than really doesn't work. Uh, may, they may issue up however, to. sets an upper limit. Um, and I, my understanding of the amendment request was to change the floor that there will be at least six Class A licenses in each other. No, there's the there's the potential for at least six Class A licenses. Not, right. There, there are only going to be six Class A licenses if six businesses want to open and bring applications and the board approves them. Right. It's... So that, that, well, my understanding of, and Senator Hester can correct me here, my understanding was she was trying to change the, the, the floor, as, as she put it in this case, that was changing the, the, the ceiling. If we say may issue up to, then um, the most any county can have is six, whereas our, our discussion up to this point has been. So could we say up to six class A licenses in each election district, regardless of the population and more than six if the population warrants? Sorry, I'm just, I'm just thinking about the- uh, sure. Can I, I would just say if you remove the words, uh, no fewer than. The board may issue, notwithstanding, the board may issue six Class A licenses in each elected district, regardless of population. So you would have it say this? Oh. I don't know if that does it either. It might make it so they can't go up six still. It's a little better, I thought. You issue six Class A licenses in each district, regardless of population. Hmm. I'm concerned that still limits you to six yeah, if the population so, yeah. goes higher. I'm sorry. That was a try. Sorry. Do we have a Mr. Chair here? I raised my hand, yeah. but are you there? Yeah, we, we're still just trying to work on the amendment. Do you have a question on the amendment? I know there's well, folks that are- Well, I was just, uh, I, to I wanted to make a suggestion that it, it may be hard to do this um, in a meeting format, and I feel like we're rushing it. Is it possible to hold the bill and work on the amendment and bring it back when, when it's uh, completed next? Next meeting, that's just my suggestion, but if you want to keep working on it, that's fine. Any, why, why don't we see if there are any other thoughts on this amendment so that we can try to make sure that we get this right. Um, otherwise, we're going to end up with an amendment coming back that um, is still 
not in line with what we were thinking. Um, I see on the in the list um, we had Delegate Terraza who had a question, Delegate Hill who may have had a question answered but also identified a question, um, and then Delegate Atterbury. Delegate Terraza. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to um, say that I'm still very concerned about this. I think it makes sense to draft it offline, but I'm still quite concerned about this amendment and wanted to point out, I, I thought we were talking about um, just one district, but we're talking about two districts um, that have right now have fewer than six licenses. So we're increasing them in two different districts in both four and three. Um, and I, I think, I don't know, I guess I at least need time to take a look at that. I, I was after our meeting with um, Mr. Milani, very, very comfortable with the bill. And I do understand the concern of the folks in the West that they wanna make sure that they have um, some opportunity for liquor licenses and again, I'm more than comfortable shifting them from the east, but I am concerned about this, but I really do see this as an increase in liquor licenses. This is a six, I mean, if you look at the chart of how many um, liquor licenses are in the county with, without, without this amendment, it's 61, and with this, it's 67. So I guess I'm, I'm not understand the, um, I guess I don't understand how this is not an increase. And I do understand that there's rounding, but it's still with this, without the amendment at 61 and with the amendment at 67. So I'd like to find a way to accommodate what Senator Hester is trying to do, but I'm very concerned about this amendment. So I just wanna make sure that there's an yeah. assent out there that everybody's supportive of this. Why don't we try to to do it? Why don't we try to get through the rest of the comments and then we'll work on the amendment. In the meantime, we'll move to the next bill. But um, I want to finish the folks that at least said that they had a question. Delegate Hill, you had a, identified a question. Anything else? Senator that, Lamb, yeah. Can I follow up with something that um, Senator Hester wrote in there? Are there currently sixty-seven licenses today? I, I just want to make sure that I'm not saying something inaccurate. Is it, would it be, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt Senator Lamb, but I do think I might have, if I misspoke, I want to make sure I'm not misspeaking on that. Lana, you want a you quick have, answer to that question? Yeah, currently there's 61 licenses in use in the county. The districts that we're talking about are districts three and four, of which they call for seven licenses and currently hold six. So you would be adding five more licenses to get them to 12 and between the two districts. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, Delegate Hill, you said you had a question. Has that been answered? I have Mr. Milani in, in the discussion with uh, Delegate, uh, Chair Felt, Feltmark about the language um, have addressed that. And again, I just would, would reiterate some, some of what um, Delegates Tarasa and Watson said, I think there's a lot more going on with this bill, so. Um, okay. And then and a potential one to limit the, um, the density. Thank you. Delegate Watson identified a question earlier too. I think that was already answered, right? Um, and then last, Delegate Atterbury, your question. Uh, my question, was, question in the, in the, it was answered. Okay, yeah, all right. Why don't we um, work on this amendment for now? Um, we do have other bills on the agenda. <clears throat> and if I we have I'm, time, yeah. Can I just ask um, Senator Hester a, a, a question? Um, because just uh, I think some of the, the 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 comments in the discussion feel to me like uh, we're aiming for a couple of different things. Can you outline for me? I guess in a um, uh, a, a twenty thousand resident election district is your intent. That were the amendment to pass, um, there would be at least there there would be six um, uh, licenses 
issued by the board or that the board could issue a sixth license rather than if we're saying just one for every 4,000 residents, they would be limited to five. Are we giving them the option of a sixth or are we saying there shall be six? We are giving them the option to issue a sixth. Okay. Thank you. Okay, great. So um, why don't we work on that amendment? And in the meantime, we'll move on to Howard County 15-21. This is the fee for rental housing services. Doug at Feldmar is a sponsor. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And unfortunately, um, Dar is not going to get too much work done right now on the other amendment because he needs to pull up. Um, Dara, if you could please share your screen with the amendment for this bill. Okay. Um, so this is um, a, a, a lengthy amendment, but mostly uh, includes issues that we have already um, already discussed just in, in how we've talked about the bill. Um, starting with um, some definition changes, um, we are amending the definition of educational services um, to include um, landlords so that information about the, the laws and um, regulations around rental properties um, that would be available not only to tenants but to landlords as well. And of course, for the, the larger well-established landlords who own you know, multiple apartment complexes, um, they would un be unlikely to rely on, on this service for that information, but for a small landlord who, you know, owns one townhouse they rent out, it, it may be a useful resource for them. So we wanted to include them. Um, and also wanted to include, uh, there you'll see in um, Roman numeral two, services designed to provide information about and referrals to available resources, including, but not limited to rental assistance and eviction prevention. So we want this to be not just education about legal rights, but also education about um, practical resources to, to help tenants in need. Um, then we're also adding a definition for legal services. In the original bill, we referred to legal services, but it was not defined. Um, so services designed to prevent tenants from being evicted, including representation during eviction proceedings or landlord-tenant mediation. Um, then in the uh, list of types of units that are excluded from, um, from the fee, um, adding clarification that, that uh, just as this does not apply to assisted living or group homes, it also does not apply to um, continuing care retirement communities. Um, finally, uh, not finally, next, <laughs> um, adding that, uh, clarifying that the fee is per unit. Um, we are deleting at least, um, so the initial fee is $30, but that is not necessarily a floor. If over time um, the county finds that they do not need um, the fee to be that high to, to cover these services, or if other streams of funding uh, become available, uh, that can be reduced. So um, then we get into uh, clarifying uh, that the whole next section is around clarifying that um, the, the county may adjust the fee in, in the future in either direction. Um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep walking through this. And Dara, I want to come back to that because I just got some some feedback from the county about potential rewording there to, to help clarify that. Um, so the next uh, key point is that for affordable units, moderate income housing units or other um, types of affordable units, um, the fee will be half of, of what it is for market rate units. So initially starting at $15 per unit. And if the fee should change in the future, it would, um, go to 50% of whatever that market rate fee is. Um, and then if you can scroll down a little more, Dara, thank you. Then um, 
we go into the, the next section, um, the bill as originally drafted contemplated um, county legislation to establish these details um, in the interest of time um, working with the county, uh, we decided we could um, lay out the basic parameters and allow them to get started um, in working on the program uh, without having to go through another entire legislative process. So this just um, lays out that the county executive may designate either a county agency or an outside entity, which could be a, a nonprofit organization to provide these services. Um, the educational services would be available to any tenant or landlord who needs assistance. Um, legal services would be available to tenants with a household of up to 60% of the median household income in Howard County. So that aligns with the income threshold for eligibility for um, rental units in the moderate income housing unit program. Um, finally, the the bill um, takes effect on July 1st, but the, the services um, provided in the section uh, should be being provided by October 1st. And, um, and then it adds an annual report um, for uh, the, an update on the funds received, funds spent, and um, and the services provided. So happy to answer any questions about the amendment. So, um, so a few things. One, uh, there's some questions about whether this is in the Google Drive or if we can share it. Um, if it's not in the drive, it probably is, I think. But um, Abby, if you can send that around to the um, members, um, they can at least have a look at that. Um, yeah, I know, and, and Sarah, if you can get it to Abby, if you haven't yet, I know it was late that it was still being reviewed. Okay. Now I know when we talked about this earlier, we we're joined by now um, Senator Gazzoni and also uh, Delia Pendergrass. Um, it, I think the thought that we had proposed earlier was to um, now that we have them here to take bills that have been moved um, for voting earlier um, and try to get through as many as we can. Because um, I know they're, they're available to be short this morning. So uh, Madam Co-Chair, do you want to move back to the education bill? Sure. Um, Abby, can you, uh, we're going to go back to Howard County 521. Abby, can you please uh, call the vote for us? Sure, uh, Senator Lamb. So this is on the bill for 521, 521. yeah. Real quick, say what 521 is, I'm moving around. I was, I was looking for amendments. They're not coming through my mail right now. Um, what, what, 521? 521 is the first bill that we talked about, about um, the, uh, guardrails on the Board of Education Redetermination of Geographic Attendance Areas. Thank you. Uh, Abby, you can continue. Sorry, Senator Lamb? Yes. Senator Gazzoni? Yes. Senator Hester? Senator Hester? Yes. Uh, Delegate Feldmark? Yes. Delegate Atterbury? Yes. Delegate Ebersole? Yes. Delegate Hill? Yes. Delegate Kittleman? Delegate Kittleman? You're muted. Pass. So pass, we'll come back to you at the end. So, Thank you. Okay, go ahead. Proceed, Delegate, Abby. <laughs> Delegate Novotny? Yes. Delegate Pendergrass? Unmute. You're muted. You'd think I'd be much better at this by then. Yes, <laughs> by now. Uh, Delegate Tarasa? Yes. And Delegate Watson? 
You're muted also. Sorry about that. Um, I agree that 100% with what you were trying to do on this, Senator Lamb, but having been a school board member, um, I really believe that this is best placed with the elected school board, that they make these decisions. Many of these documents are um, developed every year, and we could, as a, as a state delegation, ask for a meeting with um, the Board of Education to review this anytime we wish. Um, but I just don't think this should be legislated. And I don't think, I think we should be very careful about getting into the granular level of the Board of Education, which is duly elected by the citizens. So that's sort of my stance on a lot of these Board of Education bills. So I know it doesn't come as a surprise. So my vote is no. Um, with seven yeses, one. Uh, no. Do we need Delegate Kettleman? We're going to come back to. Uh, yeah, I, I as well will vote no. Okay. Two no's and seven yeses from the House delegation and three yeses from the Senate delegation. The motion passes. Okay. And just for clarification, who moved and seconded on 521? By, by my notes, I have that Terry, uh, I'm sorry, Delegate Hill moved and Senator Lamb seconded. Okay. And then moving on to Howard County 721, which is uh, Senator Lamb's bill on redistricting regarding public testimony. I don't believe we had a motion previously, so I will move approval. Excuse me, could, could these bills don't seem to appear on the website. Could you just give me a sentence as to which one this is? When yeah, so, vote on them. so Howard County 7-21 is the one that would re require one last hearing. Okay, any that's polygons. fine. Polygons, okay. Abby, do you want to go proceed? So do we have a second? Yes, I did. Senator Lamb, how do you vote? Uh, yes. Senator Gazzoni? Senator Gazzoni? You're muted. Yes. Senator Hester? Yes. Delegate Feldmark? Yes. Delegate Atterbury? Yes. Delegate Eversoll? Yes. I will say that I'm voting yes, but I am somewhat concerned about the feedback loop that this might create. We may have to address it in the future. Delegate Hill? Yes. Delegate Kittleman? Yes. <laughs> Delegate Novotny? Yes. Delegate Pendergrass? Yes. Delegate Tarasa? Yes. And Delegate Watson? Um, again, on this bill, I agree 100% that neighborhoods should be notified if they are under consideration for being moved. And the Board of Education should make every effort to make sure that they are getting feedback from anyone affected. However, I believe that these are decisions at the granular level that belong with the duly elected Board of Education, and my vote is no. Uh, eight yeses and one no in the House delegation and three yeses in the Senate. This motion passes. Okay, and those are the only two bills that we had um, ready to vote on. So, um, Mr. Chair, can we go back to where we were in the discussion um, of the, uh, um, for so we are on, yes, we're on, um, Howard County 15-21. Um, you had just introduced the uh, series of amendments that, um, I think, um, hopefully Mr. Moriarty was able to share that with, um, with Abby and if that went out to everyone, yes, anything that, yeah, then, okay, great. Um, Delegate Feldmark, anything else you want to add on that amendment? Or did so, you complete? Um, Mr. Moriarty, if you could bring it up again, um, as I as I mentioned as we were um, talking through it, I did get one piece of feedback from the county, and uh, Mr. Moriarty, I emailed that to you. I hope you had a chance to see that. Yes. 
Okay. And so the, the suggestion I believe was that um, rather than saying, um, oh, you've already made the change. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I actually, um, I, I think perhaps we should make another change um, to this uh, three paragraph two. Um, I think it would be better to say that uh, the fee set shall remain effective until altered. Um, because currently it reads as though um, in fiscal year 2022, okay. it'll be $30. The governing body could change it. And if they change it, that fee remains in effect. Someone might argue that if they don't change it, this shall remain in effect would not apply to the $30 premium. Okay, so um, so in Romanet, so just, you're just deleting by the governing body? Perfect. Yeah. Okay, and then in in paragraph four, um, Romanet two, do you need to make a corresponding change or is that okay? Because until the governing body acts. Yeah, in, in fiscal year 20, in each fiscal year, it'd be 50 year of the, um, of the set per unit amount. Um, I know you would say that the market rate amount, I don't, I'm not sure that. Um, I, I don't think this is going to end up with like a uh, kind of collapsing sort of 50% loop. Um, okay, so. Okay. If, I mean, I think that it doesn't strike me as elegant, but I think it's clear. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so. <laughs> So is that, do you feel that? I, I feel that achieves what we wanted to achieve unless somebody okay. feels. Okay, thank you. So that was that was the one piece of feedback we had received um, early this morning. And uh, if there are any questions, I'm happy to try to answer them. Okay, any questions? I put one in the chat. I put a question in the chat. All right. Um, question on the amendment. Go ahead, Doug and Hill. Thank you. Um, Doug, uh, Chairman Felt, Mark, if you could explain the purpose, and I'm also confused about the three, one, and two, which seem like heads and tails of the same statement. So what is this overall? What are you trying to achieve with the amendment? And then three, one, and three, two, how are they different? So, um, so, so the amendment addresses several issues that were raised. Um, a few um, that are are clarifying, and a few that are um, sort of getting at points we had discussed in presenting the bill earlier. Um, clarifying that uh, this is, you know, clarifying what educational services and legal services we're referring to. Um, specifying that the, the legal services are for um, households with income up to 60% of the Howard County median. So this is you know, legal services for tenants who would not have the financial resources to, to pay for legal representation. Um, and uh, you know, the, the pieces you just asked about around the fee are really um, clarifying that it is $30 per unit until the county takes action to change that amount. And that, that whatever fee the county sets will remain in place until the county takes action to change the amount, right? It's, it's not a fee that has to be um, reassessed every year. Um, and then adding the annual reporting provision so that we get a regular update from the county to see the amount collected, the amount spent, and the services provided. Okay, so for wordsmithing, if 3-1 says the governing body may alter the fee by resolution, uh, why is 2 the fee shall set 
the fee set shall remain effective until altered. Uh, how is that not redundant? Um, Dara, I don't know if you want to address that. I guess or, it's really it is. Would ask, is there a is there a problem you're concerned about? Well, only only to the extent that when we talk about these things, and, and you're you know certainly expert in Dara, this is what Dara does. It sometimes if you put something in that's redundant, it leads to problems later on. So. To me, beginning in fiscal year 2023, the governing body may alter the fee by resolution already implies that they're in control of the fee and it stays there until they alter it again. And I just wanted to find out because Dara thought it was important to take out governing body in two. I'm just not clear why we need to have two at all, Dara. And it's more a case of if the governing body chooses not to alter the fee, and that it would roll over from fiscal year to fiscal year. Doesn't that, isn't that how the fees work generally? I, 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 not, not all fees, some fees have to be established every year. So this is clarifying that this would not be. So if the council doesn't, if the county doesn't act, mm -hmm. the fee would not go away. Correct. Okay, if you all say that's needed, okay, thank you. Move the, I'll move the amendment. I'll second. second. All right, the motion to move the amendment, uh, Senator Lamb. Uh, yes. Senator Gazzoni. Yes. Uh, Senator Hester. Yes. Delegate Feldmark. Yes. Delegate Atterbury? Yes. And can I just make a suggestion? If we're going to have a detailed amendment like this in the future, can we please have like a delineated copy? Because it's kind of hard to follow. Just a suggestion. Delegate Eversole? Yes. Delegate Hill? Yeah. Delegate Kittleman? Delegate Kittleman? I'm sorry, yes. Delegate Novotny? Yes. Delegate Pendergrass? Yes. Delegate Tarasa? Yes. Delegate Watson? Yes. The motion passes. So. Move the bill. Second. Second. Sorry, I missed that. Who was the second? I believe I did, and Delegate Tarasa did. I'm happy for Delegate Feldberg to be the second. The motion is as amended, right? Right. Okay. On the bill is amended. Okay. Uh, Senator Lamb? Uh, yes. Delegate, or sorry, Senator Gazzoni? Yes. Senator Hester? I'm a no, and I'd just like to ex explain my vote. Um, I think it's a really difficult time um, right now to be you know, raising fees. And we, we've got the letter from the Housing Affordability Coalition, which outlines the kind of existing process that they're going through. So while I appreciate um, the chair's um, <laughs> Intent on this. It's a really good intent. I just, unfortunately, I'm going to vote no. Delegate Feldmark? Yes. Delegate Atterbury? Yes. Delegate Eversole? Yes. Delegate Hill? Yes. Delegate Kittleman? No. Delegate Novotny? Oh, this is a terrible time to increase fees, and I agree with the, what the Senator said. Delegate Pendergrass? Yes. Delegate Tarasa? Yes. Uh, Delegate Watson? I'm um, a little bit torn on this bill. Um, I think we really do need this kind of service. I just don't know if the $30 fee on the landlord is the way to go. Um, 
if it's something that we value as a state and county, um, you know, have we, have we made enough of an effort to figure out how this could be funded without creating a new revenue stream? So I'm uncomfortable about the fee part of it, although I do agree with the sentiment and appreciate all the work that Delegate Thelmark has done on it. Um, so I'm gonna vote no on this bill, thank you. Uh, three no's and six yeses. The motion passes the House of Delegates and with two yeses and one no on the Senate, it passes the Senate as well. Okay, thank you, Abby. Um, next on the list, we have um, Howard County 10 21. This is the Board of Education School Safety Personnel, uh, Delegate Atterbury, the sponsor. Is there anything that I know we had discussed this at length last week? Um, is there anything? What, I'm sorry, you cut off a little bit. Did you just say, is there anything I wanted to add? Yeah. Um, yes, just really quickly, everyone, thank you, Mr. Chair. Everyone should have received um, a pretty detailed letter in addition to um, them testifying previously at our hearing, um, the Disability Rights Maryland um, sent uh, a pretty detailed letter in their strong support of um, removing SROs from the Howard County um, public schools based on um, seeing traumatic and harmful interactions with the police and individuals, students with disabilities. Um, and I also wanna comment on the information that was sent to everyone last night, um, I, I guess by the administration. So one of the documents is entitled Frequently Asked Questions, Howard County School Resource Officers. And the first line, it says, what is the primary purpose of SROs? And it says the goal of the goal of the SRO program is to build positive relationships. Well, the purpose of the SRO pro, uh, of the SROs is to police the schools. That's what the um, the MOU with the police department and the school system says. They are a policing function. Um, so that is uh, actually incorrect. Um, and then there was um, an attempt to address the situation that Ms. Um, Shavari, who is here, um, had described last week that she saw. Um, and I will just say that that completely differs from the public statement that the, the student who it happened to um, actually um, um, said. So um, she, the student said that at the school, she wasn't arrested because it was the teachers who were able to prevent that um, from happening and get her into uh, a teacher's classroom. And that's why she didn't go to the police department. Um, and um, I, I have the video if anybody um, would like um, to see it. Um, also, the information that was sent um, points out that the police are performing a mental health function, which is not their function. That's actually kind of uh, problematic, I would um, suggest. Um, that's not what the police should be doing in our schools. That's why today in um, Ways and Means, they're hearing a bill to shift the funds towards more mental health services um, and guidance counselors um, and, and the like. Um, there were some questions um, and, and I want to point out, I take it for granted, I hear this all the time um, because I am on judiciary, but when you hear the difference between paper arrests and physical arrests, it's still a huge deal because the child is put into the Department of Juve Juvenile Services, DJS. And once you're put into DJS, one, you are on parole until you're 21 years old, okay? So there is a bill to try to change that, but you are on essentially parole until you're an adult, whether that incident happened whether you're 15 or um, 18. So once you're in the system, you're in the system. Um, so a, if you have a paper arrest, that is gonna follow you. It's not like, oh, they just received a paper arrest. It's a very big deal that will affect um, your, your future. Um, so I would just reiterate and I've, the bill was already moved and it was already seconded. Um, so I would like to vote on it after further discussion. Um, 
you know, we are in a time right now where we are, because of everything that's happened across the country, we are undertaking significant police reform. And we are doing that here in Maryland. And I think that taking a look at um, school officers um, in our schools, we should, we should include them in that reform. And um, I think the rest of the general, well, the House, we have several bills, um, statewide bills related to that, um, that are being heard um, today. Um, our school system already has to come up with an adequate, adequate coverage plan. Um, they have done that for the schools that do not have SROs in them. And so the ask would be that they do that for the schools that have SROs. Um, the SROs in our schools do are disproportionately placed in the schools where the students um, have increased, or the schools have increased farm um, populations in the middle schools and in um, the high schools. Um, and so I would ask that we um, vote on the bill, Mr. Chair. There are any other, I see that there are some questions. Um, so I think. I think we should address these two. So um, I see Delegate Watson. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, we, I just wanna make sure that as a, as a delegation, we hear from the superintendent on the bill. And if he is with us, I had a particular question for him. Is, uh, is he with us? I'm here, can you hear me? Yes. Good morning. Good morning. So I know basically based on my experience as a school board member that this program goes back to, I wanna say the late nineties. Right. Um, and I know that there was a significant incident at one of our high schools that sort of prompted the board to um, participate in this program. So we know that in the, at the local level, the program has been, been around for 23 years. And no doubt as things have evolved in our society, it probably does need, um, some review. So what I, I know that the board and you have been looking at this and I just was wondering if you have alternatives in mind or um, I guess better said, I don't know where you are in your process with the board. So I wouldn't wanna circumvent that, but hypothetically, what would you recommend as a, as a replacement and how long would it take and how much would it cost and what would it look like? Yeah, uh, good morning, members of the delegation. It's an uh, honor to be with you this morning to talk about this topic, which is extremely important to our community. Uh, Ms. Watson, you are correct. Let me provide clarity to the record that the SRO program has been in place in the Howard County public school system since 1998 in the fashion of which we know it, uh, advanced as a result of a tragic death of a Wild Lake uh, school staff member uh, in regard to de-escalating a physical altercation. Uh, prior to that, we've had police liaisons in the school since 1991. So there has been some level of police presence in our schools uh, since 1991, which is close to 30 years. Uh, where we currently are as a school system is that uh, our school system has responded very assertively uh, to the national concerns, uh, issues associated with our own local students, past students who've sent petitions to the board and our, my, the Board of Education has directed me to examine this, uh, the development of a plan uh, to move forward. In our last board meeting, uh, where we had this discussion, uh, I recommended two paths forward for our Board of Education. One was the examination of the current program uh, to make modifications to the program uh, through the SRO uh, Memorandum of Understanding. That's one path. The second was the removal of SROs uh, completely, which I have defined and have gone on record of saying that it has to be a repeal and replace uh, program that I'm looking to change the culture of the school system that is more in alignment uh, with our restorative practice uh, focus, uh, that if we do a repeal and replace, there would be a complement of staff members to support our high schools. We just can't extract one day and then hope the next day that we can develop a plan that would support the safety and well-being of all of our students in, in all of our schools. So as we are beginning those, um, the, the development of those plans, even taking more muscle to that plan, had some discussion with the board yesterday in our budget sessions uh, about in, 
adding additional safety and security assistance which are unarmed individuals that we have a cadre of individuals in our school system right now of about 17 or 18 of those individuals that support the operations of our schools. I would be seeking uh, the combination of additional counselors, uh, alternative education teachers and social workers to provide that support, not only in regards to the management and reaction, but then a proactive way uh, to address the concerns that young people are, are experiencing during all of our times as we see. I wanna have a more responsive way uh, to that. So that would be an option. There is a price tag to that Delegate Watson uh, and other members of the delegation. And as advising the board through our budget process that we would advocate for those fundings and build that into the budget. But a rough number around that, if you're looking at a, an FTE of about 70,000 and I've just defined uh, five positions as a possibility. That would be approximately $350,000. Uh, Eric, you can, Delegate Ebersol, you can correct my math on that as a math teacher as well uh, regarding that. But then taking that and extrapolating that to all of our high schools uh, and then supports at our middle school would be between four and, four and $5 million of new recurring dollars that would have to occur uh, for our school system. But I firmly believe that we are at a juncture uh, if this is what our community is advocating for, that we need to uh, advocate for the funding to support this shift. At the same time, understand my top priority as superintendent of this school system is to provide a safe and orderly environment uh, for all of our children at all levels and having the necessary supports to do so. Uh, so Delegate Watson, that's a, a long answer to a relatively short question and I'll go deeper if necessary. Um, I appreciate that. Um, it sounds like the replacement program would be, to me, it sounds, it sounds um, good, but how long do you need to sort of develop that? I mean, can you do it in 30 days? Does it take longer? Um, the security assistants, are they normal people in the, in the, in the uh, community or are they retired police officers or... Yeah, so, so first and foremost, let me go back and I recognize our chief of police is on here and I want to thank her for her support and providing uh, the support to our schools, the collaborative relationship that we have. The other piece of this that I have to also navigate with our board and with our uh, collaboration with our chief of police is the clear uh, clarity of the Safe to Learn Act that says if we do not have law enforcement, if we do not have SROs, there has to be adequate law enforcement coverage. And the individuals who are part of the SRO program do receive additional training uh, from the Maryland Center of School Safety uh, that is a support. So I would have to also be in compliant with providing that adequate coverage uh, by utilizing the collaboration with the chief of police, how we would do that. So that would be one process. Second would be then how we would phase this in. Uh, would we have the funding to do it all at once as on a July 1st basis? Uh, and then the timing necessary for all of that would be based on the variables of available funding and supports necessary to do that. And then I think the third prong, which you highlighted is obviously we would be hiring additional staff and there's a process to develop uh, out those job descriptions to be more in line with our restorative culture and then putting those uh, out for uh, review as well as then getting applications in. Those individuals, uh, Delegate Watson, could come from a variety of sources, uh, people who have background in criminal justice, uh, law enforcement. There's a whole series of things. But the bottom line is those individuals would be supervised by the school system and not in, with the police department. So I would be able to have the supervision of those individuals assigned to schools and supervised by the individual principals of those schools. Okay, thank you. That's it for me for now, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you. And um, Senator Sam had to go get tested. So um, next uh, question I believe is from Delegate Navani. Yes, ma'am, thank you so much. Uh, and I do appreciate you inviting some other guests this morning. I would like to uh, give some time to them obviously to have them testify. And I do appreciate uh, Delegate Atterbury for bringing up this very important topic. And I appreciate her vote for the 2018 Safe to Learn Act that provided the SROs to everyone in Maryland if they wanted them. 
I would like to just start off by saying that there are multiple studies showing that having SROs in the schools actually reduces the school to prison pipeline. Uh, and there are no way to show actually how many things they have prevented and how many good things they have done. I feel we're in a place where we have collective punishment for isolated guilt. And I have to say it twice, collective punishment for isolated guilt. There might be a few bad apples out there, but that does not take away from all the good the SROs have done over the years. So I would like to pass my time to the chief who's on here to give a little testimony about the SRO program from her perspective uh, and to uh, explain any other questions that uh, our team has. Thank you. Can I just, um, I'm, I'm sorry, Chief, before you begin, um, Delegate Novotny, I, can you please just clarify your question because my this question is not is an opportunity for testimony. We have to provide on the SRO program. Chief Myers, go ahead, thank you. Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for this opportunity. I also wanted to make you aware that we do have three of our school resource officers on the line as well. Um, PFC Leah Littlefield, she is the school resource officer for Wild Lake Middle and Harper's Choice Middle School. PFC Philip Lilly, who is the high school resource officer for Howard and PFC Steve Willingham for Glenelg High School. So um, before I am the chief of police, I am the mother of a young adult black male. So I understand the importance of looking at sensible reform for policing and making sure that all members of our community feel safe in their interactions with the police department but particularly our black and brown students. Um, you know, I know this is a very passionate topic, but in my role, I have to deal with fact. And um, just going back to talk about our role as a police department. Our role in the community, as well as in the schools are twofold. To make sure our communities are safe and to make sure we are building strong relationships. That is factual. That is how we are successful and how we work together with our community. I believe we have a great SRO program, one that we can certainly work with the schools to build upon those things that need improvement. But if we get caught into looking at a national narrative and trying to apply a remedy locally, I think that we could potentially damage what is a good program. What is fact is that we do not use our SRO program as a school to prison pipeline. We use it to make sure we have officers who are in the school helping to maintain a safe learning environment for our students teachers and administrators. All of our officers and particularly our officers in the school are trained to use the least amount of force necessary. They are trained to try to resolve issues um, as best they can before using force and using arrest as an option. Anytime we make an arrest in the school system, we do it in conjunction with the administrators, making sure there are not any other remedies from a school perspective that should be used to address those incidents. And, you know, I just like to add, there are probably 59,000 students or somewhere around that in the school system. Our 19 SROs interact with students, thousands of students through the school year thousands and thousands to include minority students. And the times that they make arrests are very minute. And even in those times, 80% of the arrests that we make in the schools are handled as referrals, which means we use diversionary um, or restorative justice options to keep our kids from going into the school system. And if you have an opportunity to speak to any of our our SROs on the line, 
they will tell you. Some people will say, well, um, you know, they're on a lot of school shootings, so we don't know how many school shootings they are preventing. But there are a ton of students who call, who text their SROs to let them know about fights that are occurring or issues that are occurring, domestic related issues at home. So they have built a level of trust with students. And one of the things that is important to note about our program as well, is that we are not just there in a security capacity. 15 of our 19 SROs are coaches, um, either in the schools or in the communities. And we layer our program with uh, youth programs and camps and other things that help to create opportunities where we are building positive interactions between police and our community. Um, and with that, I will be open for any questions that you have for me. Okay, thank you, Chief Myers. Um, and our next question is from Delegate Kittleman. Uh, thank you very much. And I actually do have a question for you, but first I, I would like to ask Delegate Atterbury, have we surveyed each of the high schools and the middle schools that have uh, SROs and gotten any feedback from them? You mean, have I surveyed their principals who are, who are you asking? Well, I, it just, <clears throat> I'm not sure exactly what the right grouping would be, but I, I would expect there's a way to find out how different schools and the students and the administration feel about the SROs. Well, I Gathering think, information, I guess. I think the fact that the school board um, in September convened and started to look at this issue. They've taken two votes on the issue and they've been unable to act. And in fact, their most recent action was to wait and decide this issue until April. So, I mean, that's, you know, nine or so months that this issue um, would be pending. But I think the fact that it's in front of the school board um, shows you that it's of great concern uh, to the community. I, I appreciate that. And I don't mean to demean the school, but I, I, I guess I have an issue because quite frequently these days we seem to be going on anecdotal information and I value anecdotal information, but there will always be terrible incidents and I, we just need to be careful not to allow, you know, a few terrible instances to undermine things that by and large are extremely important. Um, I heard, I believe the school board I was listening in and you were talking to Glen Elk. Glen Elk seems to be pretty satisfied and happy with, uh, with their program. And one of the things I was gonna ask the chief to uh, comment on is, uh, it may sound silly, but I don't think it is. Apparently at Glen Elk, they're trying a new um, uh, approach with casual uniforms. And that seems to make a huge difference. And I can imagine it would be because police uniforms are pretty uh, intimidating as they should be. But could you just comment on that? Yes, ma'am. So last year we demoed a more dressed down uniform at the Homewood School. And one of the things, so I have to tell you initially, I was not a fan of it. I am old school in a way that I believe there is a reason we wear uniforms, people identify with it. But one of the things we found is that with a younger school-based population, um, they tended to feel more comfortable engaging the SRO um, just by doing something as simple as changing that uniform. One of the things that we talked about in terms of if we were to move forward with the SRO programs in the school is that we would change the uniform for all SROs to a more casual dress down uniform that does create more of an inviting um, atmosphere for the students. Thank you. Okay, and um, next question is from Senator Hester. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, 
I'd really like to start by commending the vice chair of judiciary for her leadership in this area. Um, I'm really supportive of the ongoing efforts for greater transparency and accountability in policing. And it's absolutely necessary that we get that right for public trust. Um, I've also heard from constituents in my district on both sides of this issue, and they're all, they're all passionate. Um, re reading through the Board of Education reports, which, which I requested um, you know, last week, there's, there's a lot of information there. And so my question is, is for the superintendent again. I understand that you're in the middle of the process. And, and that's what my question is. I, I know that you're considering an updated uh, MOU. Um, and I'm just curious how the process that you're going in through right now, how that fits in uh, with, with the Safe to Learn Act. And if when is the board expecting to have this information? Like, are you expecting to have this information by your April, April meeting? And could you make a decision then? Um, I'm just really concerned that there's competing processes, you know, both at the local level and also at the state level, we're considering statewide legislation. So um, Dr. Marano, if you're still on, could you just ask me, could, could you just answer the question about where you are in the process and how this bill would affect your process? Yes, Senator, I'll be more than happy to do so. Uh, first and foremost, let me set the, the action for the Board of Education has been set for April 29th. Uh, based upon the process. This has been a very long process of review. At the last board meeting where I brought this up, I made the recommendation as stated earlier uh, for the Board of Education to take all the information that they have available to them, including the fact that there are several different uh, bills being considered at the state level, as well, obviously, the one of which we're discussing today. Two different uh, areas of focus. One would be the elimination of SROs, uh, which I've talked about repeal and replace. Second would be then adjustments of the current SRO program uh, based upon some of the things that uh, Chief Myers just talked about. How would we develop an MOU that would uh, memorialize some of the conversations that we've had during that time? So the board has in front of those uh, two decisions uh, to consider uh, and making a choice between those or something that may evolve as a result of the legislation discussions uh, during the, the, uh, the General Assembly. And signee die, I believe, is on April 12th, so that we would have the consideration of then a recommendation to the board by April 29th. Thank you. And um, actually, I was next. Um, so. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, my question really deals with the alternative to SROs as it's described in the bill. And um, I don't have the exact language in front of me, but it's, uh, pull it up, um, uses adequate local law enforcement coverage to implement the guidelines. And so my question, I think both for um, Dr. Martirano speaking from the, the school systems perspective, and for Chief Myers, speaking from the police department's perspective, can you give us a better sense of what that adequate local law enforcement coverage would look like? Is it, is it simply responding to calls for service? Is there something more than that, but you know, less than having SROs actually based in the school system? If this bill were to pass, that's the plan that would have to be developed and submitted. So can you give us a little more detail on what that alternative would look like? Madam Chair, if I may real quick, just as a point of information, that adequate coverage is in the school safety bill. So we, right now, Howard County would have to conform to that if they don't have an SRO in the building. Correct, correct. Just clarifying, that wouldn't be new. Chief Myers, you want to take the first uh, bite of the apple and then I'll follow up with the experience that I have as a principal in that arena? Absolutely. So basically for ad adequate coverage, our patrol officers would respond to schools for any emergency situations, the same as for any school that doesn't have an SRO assigned. Um, but I will say there is a benefit to having officers responding to incidents. So whether or not you take SROs out the school, there will probably still be uh, incidents where police assistance is needed. 
I think that there is a benefit to having police officers already having established relationships with students and parents. Um, those established relationships help to ensure we have positive outcomes when we have those interactions. But short answer is certainly our patrol officers would respond and that would um, satisfy the need for adequate coverage. Delegate Feldmark, if I, if I may, I wanna provide a, a context from my experience of being a principal at all three levels, serving as a high school principal, a middle school assistant principal, and a principal at the elementary level in different counties and two different schools. And those interactions I worked in did not always have SROs assigned to them. So understand that first and foremost, the job of a building principal is to provide a safe, orderly environment for learning to occur. We are instructional leaders first and foremost, but we recognize that we have to keep our children safe before quality learning can occur. And there are many schools across the state of Maryland that do not have SROs and how they provide that safety. So I think we have to understand the broader context that not all schools in the state of Maryland have SRO coverage and how do they provide that support. So the support that I have to provide to our principals is the guidance of best practices for keeping a safe and orderly environment, keeping young people engaged, utilizing the other staff that I had talked about to keep that environment safe. And then if there would be uh, a situation that would escalate to a higher level, uh, then we would engage in, in 911 using the community policing program, the conversation we would have. There's a several tools along that continuum uh, that a principal has at his or her disposal to ensure the safety of the environment. So, uh, Delegate Feldmark, as you asked the question, I would be very, very clear about making certain that if the SROs were removed, th that we were fully in compliant with the adequate law enforcement coverage and have that memorialized in a way in an MOU working with the police department uh, to ensure that. But we have to have full coverage to ensure the safety of our young people that does not necessarily have to be SROs as defined by other counties in my prior experiences as well. Thank you. Delegate Hill. Uh, Madam Chair. Yep. So a couple of things. So, um, so as you said, this program has been there, what, since 98 after the teacher had the heart attack at Wild Lake while breaking up a fight and died, which was you know, really tragic. Um, I'm hearing a couple of things. I, I, I think um, uh, Delegate Atterbury um, has really been leading the charge on making sure that we try and get our justice system right. And her, her passion about some of the harm we're doing to our children um, with some of these programs I completely um, am aligned with. I've heard a couple of things and there's a question coming. Number one, I hear from Chief Myers that the students are communicating with the SROs in ways that we have no idea about. That they're telling them about threats that they might not otherwise be comfortable telling teachers and administrators about. So what we're seeing and what Ms. Chaveria gave witness to quite um, uh, um, strongly is when we see SROs being overused and traumatizing our kids. What I haven't heard, so this is gonna to go to either the uh, member of the school board or Dr. Martirano, the first thing is, I don't, I'm not clear that the teachers and administrators have been adequately trained on how to use SROs. So they're asking SROs to step in for discipline when the vice principals and other people should be taking care of that. And um, so they have, it seems to me, been encouraging over policing of our kids instead of treating the SROs as the people who are there for really significant safety issues. So that's the first question. What is the training that our administrators and teachers are getting about what the appropriate role is uh, for the SRO in their schools? Board members, um, I will take the first uh, bite of that apple, please. Um, we have provided um, a, additional training uh, with our SROs and our principals over the last several years. There's a component of the Maryland Safe to Learn Act 
uh, with the Maryland School Safety Center uh, that requires uh, that kind of training uh, that happens. Additionally, we know that the most important piece is the relationship that is established between the principal and the SRO. Uh, so those pieces have happened and that is ongoing. That's just not a one and done uh, kind of a process in that sense. But the point of which you do illuminate is that there has been challenges in the past of clarity of job responsibility, uh, that the school is led by the principal and the administrative team, and that they have developed great relationships with SROs, but we should not always be sending SROs to respond to disciplinary interactions that don't require that kind of involvement. And Delegate Hill, that has been a focus of the training uh, to delineate uh, those responsibilities. As stated, uh, there are plenty of schools that address those challenges without the president of law enforcement and have to do that at a progressive level uh, in involving the police officers if necessary. But the part of the training is a requirement of the Safe to Learn Act. And I can fortify that further by what is happening in Howard County with the relationship that we have with Chief Myers and the police to provide more uh, to that and it's ongoing. Okay. Ms. Catrunio, did you want to add anything to that? Um, well, first, I, I wanted to um, go back to Delegate Kittleman, who asked about the administrators. They did send a letter um, to the board with a position um, in support of SROs, but with the caveat that it was not a unanimous vote. Um, so I just, and there is a, there's, you can, there was a newspaper article written, and I can send the letter if you want that they sent, but it was not unanimous. Um, but it was, th their position was not to remove. Um, and yeah, I, I think, um, I think it's clear that the program, whatever form it is, it, it, it need, if it were to remain, it would need to be significantly um, changed because clearly there are, um, there's dissatisfaction. Um, and I think it has been changed a lot over the years um, with different organizations coming in to help. Um, I know the uh, Council of Elders has helped um, do some things to change the program um, to make it, um, you know, uh, less of a um, police focus um, in the schools. But, um, you know, I, I think going along with what Dr. Martirano said, you know, it, it is um, whether we, whatever we do, there has got to be significant change to the program, whether we transition out with you know, bringing in mental health supports and security assistance, whatever form it takes, there needs to be a change. And right. um, that, that is clear. So, so I guess my, here's my question. And, and, and to Delegate Kittleman's point, getting a survey of administrators and how they feel about it is not the same as getting a survey of students and finding out how they feel. Oh, absolutely. I agree. The PTA I and, and asking how they feel. Um, so there are a lot of, um, or, or the teachers for that matter, and asking them, the educators and, and counselors and asking them how they feel. So I think, you know, that there's an issue to the officer friendly piece and the fact that SROs are also coaches and they build relationships. That's great. There's nothing about taking the SROs that stops them from being coaches in the schools. So we don't have to have SROs in, in the school to have coaching relationships between people from the police department and our and our students. Um, my, my concern here, and, and you know, is you and the you and the school system are working on something. What this bill does is it makes you know sort of a hard stop. I'm not clear if this bill will allow you the flexibility to move the funding that you are already using for SROs to build in those behavioral health supports that you need, and to to make the soft transition to a robust support system. That, I mean, it sounds like the security piece you're comfortable with. You can go back to what you used to do before, have a good relationship with the police. And from a security standpoint, you seem to feel, if I'm hearing you right, that you can handle that. The question is, you know, these, these were put in in some ways to help behavioral health, emotional issues, and all this other stuff. It's not the right tool to address that issue. And I'm not sure that simply taking the SROs out gives you the funding you need to put the right tools in place. So, so I'm going back to you, Dr. Martirano. Yes, uh, Delegate Hill, please let me clarify. And if you, uh, for the whole body here today, 
the funding for the SRO program is with the police department. And the pol I do not receive any funding additional to support that program. So if the decision were to be made and Chief Myers then has the SROs under her auspices, which she does, if they are to be removed, that money follows back to the police department. And then she would be able to fortify as she's done during these last nine months of the pandemic, uh, the community policing programs, et cetera. There is zero money baked in to our school system budget for the repeal and replacement program. Uh, unlike other school systems, for example, Minneapolis, uh, they had the auspices of the SRO program under their jurisdiction. So when they made the decision to remove SROs, uh, they transferred that money to provide those fortified supports that I talked about. The advocacy that I'm talking about is if, these, if the SROs were to be removed from Howard County, that we would have to then address the advocacy for additional funding to support what I was talking about uh, at that level. So I just wanted to, for everybody to be clear of that if we weren't, uh, that's been a major topic of discussion about the funding streams. And, and the final point is with that funding issue um, and being what it is, I think I'm also hearing you say that if the school system, if the board decided not to remove the SROs, but to significantly revamp the MOU, your feeling is that you can do enough changes in that program and enough retraining of your personnel to address many, if not all of the issues that we are all concerned about, or you aren't so sure we can address all of those issues? Well and if I may go a little deeper with you regarding the feedback, uh, Ms. Catronio has already talked about the data which we've collected. Our administrators have taken a stance on this uh, and have taken a position, not everybody is totally in agreement. We've had forums with our community. Uh, we've had forums with our students and the feedback is, is very polarizing. Uh, there's many people who support the SRO program that, that, do, um, that, that don't support it. But what I can say to you, the adjustments that would be made to a MOU do not always address some of the number one concerns by individuals who are oppositional to SROs, which is the presence of a gun. And we, we need to be very honest about that and what it represents uh, to certain members of our community. And we hear that time and time again. I do know from talking to the, the, to the chief of police, and I don't mean to speak for her, but that's a non-negotiable. Uh, regarding that as we continue to, to navigate this path. So I can introduce things that I know work. We did the pilot program that's chief illuminated uh, regarding the softer uniform. We received great feedback from Homewood about that and the students there and the involvement and the relationships established. We can talk about uh, deeper levels of training, uh, unconscious bias, uh, de-escalation strategies, uh, restorative practices, making certain that those things are in alignment. We can do all of those, uh, but at the very root of the concerns expressed to me through the data is the presence of a gun. And do we actually need law enforcement uh, to create the safe environment for our children when we have other ways of possibly doing that uh, with non-gun carrying individuals within schools? So I wanna put all of that out with full transparency of that feedback, Delegate Hill. And if I may, Madam Chair, my final question is to Ms. Ch Chavaria, do you, um, feel with all that you've been hearing and all that you've experienced and seen uh, that we need this piece of legislation for Howard County to do what needs to be done? Or do you feel that the school system and the, um, the decision that they're wrestling with now would be able to address adequately the concerns that you've raised? Thank you for your question. Um, I, I absolutely believe that this bill is necessary. I think that um, the data is there. There's no more time to wait. Um, this is actually the perfect opportunity while we're you know, not in the buildings um, to do something now. Um, the community that has suffered the most and that has been affected by having SROs in school has waited long enough um, and it is time to take action. The data is there, the numbers are there, the disproportionality is there. Um, you know, I appreciate everything that's been said so far, um, and I and I agree that you know relationships can be built 
built. Um, there are officer. I love the officer in our in in my building, um, and I know that the officer Littlefield has great relationships with students as well. Um, but that doesn't negate the fact that they, at the end of the day, they are police required to enforce the law, who carry a gun. Um, and so in one moment, they're building relationships. And then the next moment, they have arresting powers and they can do and should and are required to enforce the law, which is their primary role in the school. So, you know, it's not about one officer. It's about the entire program. Um, it has it has gone on long enough. Um, I was present in, I was actually a student at Wild Lake in, um, in the 90s when the uh, incident occurred, I, I witnessed the entire thing. Um, I also was a student when the program started and I know how that affected our black and brown students at Wild Lake at the time. Um, and as a teacher to, to continue to see the harms that are done um, regardless of the relationships that are built because at the end of the day, like I said, students are receiving arrests and criminal records for normal childhood uh, developmentally appropriate behaviors. And as Dr. Martirano stated, um, it is high time that we you know, take a, a hard look at whose voices matter and whose voices don't. And I think he definitely adequately described the type of adjustments that we need to be made moving towards restorative practices, really showing with our actions that equity is at the forefront and that that's what we care about. Because even if one student is harmed by such a program, that should be enough um, to make sure that we're taking strong action. And so far, I appreciate the vote. I think it was a it was a good step forward um, at the board the last the last meeting. Um, but I think that at this point in time, we need to take action. It is the time to take action. Um, I think that this bill is exactly what we need. Um, we need to advocate for the funding. I agree with Dr. Martirano. The funding needs to be there as well. I think there are ways to do that. Um, and I, I think that at this time, this bill does exactly what um, we should be doing, which would be to, if, if, if the schools that we have already in the county, which are mainly white schools, have an adequate coverage plan already, um, there's no reason why our black students shouldn't be afforded the same luxuries to have an adequate coverage plan. Um, and, and, those, and those plans should and can be developed with the community, with all stakeholders, um, and, and, and police that do build relationships with students should also be involved in that plan. And so there's no reason why, um, you know, at this point, the, the, the luxuries that are afforded to our white students um, shouldn't be afforded to our black and brown students if we are really looking at true equity in our schools. And so I appreciate this bill. I am a strong um, supporter of this bill. I, I hope and I pray for the, for, for the students that I love and care about um, that, that this body takes the stance that is necessary to protect all of our students um, and make sure that safety is not just perceived, but actually exists um, for, for our students in our school system. I hope that adequately answered your question. Okay, thank you. And I believe Ms. Mallow was trying to, to respond to Delegate Hill's question as well. Um, so Delegate Hill had a great deal of questions. And one of the things that I think uh, she spoke to that's really critical is the idea of what can the school system do if it um, if the bill doesn't pass. Like, and please remember that there is no funding for additional funding for training our staff either. And if we are to there's no funding attached to this bill one way or the other. So if the fund, if this bill passes, then there's no additional funding to replace um, the SROs. And the idea that we would replace one SRO with five additional staff members is aspirational. Um, the role that they play in security is um, what we really need to focus on in terms of budgetary. The rest is the culture that we would like to build. And were they to stay in our schools, we don't have adequate funding to re retrain all of our staff in how to not use them in a disciplinary way. We can continue to work on that, but it certainly their role there is 
to be police officers. And they are good. There are many great police officers. And I think the complaints about the program are not about individuals by any sense. It is about a program that polices, that criminalizes juvenile behavior. And the fact that we do have disproportionate results, particularly with our special ed community. Um, I think the when Delegate, uh, Delegate Atterbury was talking about the fact that the um, Maryland Disabilities Group supported this bill is important to keep focused on that we are disproportionately affecting those students and the intersection between those students who are served by our special education population as well as our black and brown students because we do know that there is a higher rate of identification of black and brown students for special education services and so effectively it has the potential to double penalize those students who are most in need of our supports. So uh, thank you, board member Mallow. I apologize, I have to jump in. Those of us on the Senate side actually have to run um, to the Senate floor for a voting session. So, um, you know, in interest of time, since I know we're running the um, 11 o'clock hour, I think we're going to go ahead and adjourn right now for, um, these bills, um, I think what we're, what we're proposing to do is to file them into the hopper because of the deadline that's approaching. But if the delegation does not take affirmative action on, sorry, does not vote positively, favorably on any of these bills, that we will not send a delegation letter of support for these bills and that we would withdraw them. Um, we're doing this in the interest of time. Um, because we're running out of time on these bills. So we are gonna drop them in the hopper for now, but their outcome is pending um, the decision of the delegation. Um, Mr. Chair, would they, would they be able to be amended if we had an amendment for one of them after it was dropped in the hopper? Yes, we would offer the amendment so that the version that appears before the standing committees would match the version that um, passes the delegation. Thank you. So you can probably, you can probably offer them in committee. Yeah, yeah, I was going to so, suggest that you can offer any amendment in committee like this would go into ways and means. And I would also ask that at our next meeting, this be heard at the top of the meeting. So we don't have to keep asking folks to come back um, and speak. And, you know, could there be clarification as to whether or not there's going to be testimony? Because we did have a public hearing as opposed to folks that just answer questions. Um, I would appreciate that as well. And I also just want to say, since we're all here, because it was addressed to me and Delegate Novotny, we, we haven't met, so welcome. Um, I had a great relationship with your predecessor, so I hope you and I do as well. But perhaps you missed the, 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 the point that I made um, at the beginning of the previous meeting when I said, just as I'm chairing the Police Reform and Accountability Work Group for the House, I don't pay paint all officers with a broad brush. My grandmother was a sheriff. She's 91 retired sheriff. So I, I think that's actually why I was appointed chair of the, of, of the work group. So um, just to, to clarify that for you. Thank you for the clarification. I did appreciate and hear your testimony last time. Okay. So with that, in interest of time, um, we're gonna go ahead and adjourn. We will reconvene next um, Wednesday at 9 a.m. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thanks.